Okay, today we move into a new chapter, the last chapter we have uh, in Physics 101, which is about oscillatory motion. Let's recall at this point that Physics 101 is focused on mechanics, and mechanics is the science of motion. So let's see what kinds of motion did we discuss so far in the last 14 chapters. We have studied the motion of particles in chapters 2 to 8. We have studied the motion of rigid bodies in chapters 9 to 13, the motion of fluids in chapter 14. And therefore, we are left with one type of motion, an extremely important type of motion, and that is oscillation. Oscillation is the type of motion in which an object moves back and forth repetitively about the reference point or a reference line. It is also called vibration, harmonic motion, or periodic motion. There are plenty of examples in nature and industry on oscillatory motion. Here are some of them. Some natural phenomena are oscillatory in nature. The light we see, the sound we hear, the motion of the planets are all examples of, of oscillatory or periodic motion. Oscillatory motion has extremely important engineering applications. It is important to understand and control the vibration of engines, the vibration of civil structures like uh, bridges and buildings. Uh, remember that uh, AC circuits or AC currents are basically alternating oscillating in nature, and they form really the basis of uh, uh, the electricity that we use in our houses and uh, factories. We have already considered many examples of periodic motion, like the simple pendulum, the mass spring system, and uniform circular motion are all examples of oscillatory or periodic motion. The study control and design. We want there to, to study, understand what is going on, and then control, and then design of oscillations are three of the primary goals of both physics and engineering. In this chapter, we discuss a basic type of oscillation, the simplest type of oscillation, which is called simple harmonic motion. And we want to break this down to understand what is going on. We know what is motion, what is harmonic, and why is it simple? What is so simple about it? That's what we will see during the course of our discussion. And here is how we will proceed. First, we will study the kinematics of simple harmonic motion. That is, find the position as a function of time, and then the velocity as a function of time, and then the acceleration as a function of time. And then we will consider the force responsible for uh, simple harmonic motion. And then we will see how to calculate the energy associated with simple harmonic motion. And finally, we will consider pendulums as examples of systems or objects executing periodic motion or oscillatory motion. So let's start with the kinematics of simple harmonic motion. The figure below, what do we have here? Here we have a mass connected to a spring that is free to oscillate without friction on a horizontal surface. So the figure shows a sequence of snapshots of a simple oscillating system in which a particle moves repeatedly back and forth about the origin of an x-axis. So let's say you first pull the block to some distance, to this distance here, the maximum distance it can go from the origin, and you release it from rest at that point. So that is the time t equal to zero. That's where you start your observation. And then it will start to oscillate. So you set up your camera so that it takes a snapshot every quarter of a period. What is the period? It is the time to take one full oscillation, which is the time to go from here to there and back to here. That's a period. So every quarter of a period, let's say you, you let it go once, and find what is the period, what is the period with a stopwatch. And then you set your camera to set, take a snapshot, to take a picture every quarter of a period. 
and then see where is the uh, particle at that point and plot it on this figure. So this is the beginning, and then quarter of a period later it is here, right in the middle. Half a period later it will be crossing the origin. Then uh, uh, sometime later, uh, uh, at half the period, it will reach the other end. It will go back to the origin, and then finally it ends up where it started. So you put these together, it shows you where is the particle as a function of time. And then what we usually do is we twist this because we want to show the position as a function of time like we see it in there. And here is a dynamic picture of what is going on. That's the graph we have just seen in here. It looks sinusoidal. It looks like a sine or cosine curve. And in mathematics, anything that looks like a sine is called harmonic, a harmonic function. So that's where we put the name harmonic. It looks like a sine or cosine. We say whether it is sine or cosine, we say that it is harmonic or sinusoidal motion. And that's what we see here. Our objective in this section is to study the main features of this motion. First, what are the parameters, the basic parameters we use here? And then we use them to express the position, velocity, and acceleration of this type of motion. The first quantity which characterizes oscillatory or periodic motion is the period. The period is something we have seen starting in chapter four. It's the time to complete one oscillation, to make one full cycle or circle. That's called the period of the motion. Now, in general, uh, you can pick any two points to find the period. The period is, to time, is the time taken between two consecutive identical points. Consecutive identical points. What do you mean by consecutive? Next to each other. We have infinite of these points, but we take two that are next to each other, adjacent or consecutive. Mutajawir attain, mutatari attain. So, consecutive, identical. What do you mean by identical? They have the same displacement from the horizontal line, and both positive or negative, it doesn't matter. But what matters is they have the same sign, negative or positive, and the same distance from uh, the displacement, uh, from the horizontal. So these are identical points. The time to go between them is equal to one period of the motion. Connected with the period is another quantity called the frequency, which is symbolized by the letter F. And the frequency is the number of oscillations that are completed in each second. You uh, let the, the object oscillate one, two, three, measure the time, and they then see how many oscillations are made in one second. That is called the frequency. The SI unit for frequency is called the hertz, which is written this way. Now, if you look at these two quantities, you find that they are the reciprocal of each other. One is the reciprocal of the other one, and the relationship is very simple. One oscillation takes one period. There are F oscillations executed in one second, okay? So one is equal to FT, and therefore, if is equal to one over t, they are the reciprocal of each other. Any motion that repeats itself is called periodic motion or harmonic. We said that harmonic, anything that looks like sine cosine is harmonic. So any motion that repeats itself is called periodic or harmonic motion. We will study a special type of harmonic motion named simple harmonic motion. We know now what is harmonic. We'll see later why is it simple, in which the periodic motion is a sinusoidal function of time. So it looks like this. Could be sine or cosine. Both are equivalent. In our book, he chooses it to be a cosine function. You may read another book where they choose it to be a sine. If you remove the vertical axis, okay, if you remove the black lines and just keep the blue one, you really cannot tell whether it is sine or cosine. They are both the same. 
it will be sine or cosine depending on where you place the vertical axis otherwise they are identical so with this in mind now we are in a position to write down the position of a particle executing uh, simple harmonic. Here is the position and it varies as a function of time in a sinusoidal manner. So let's write the equation for this. This is now uh, section 1 in chapter 15 and here we are studying simple harmonic motion. We will first start by stating the position. Now we have talked about the period and the frequency. We will start by writing down the position of a particle that is performing or executing simple harmonic motion. And the equation for the position of the particle as a function of time goes like x as a function of time is equal to xm multiplied by cosine of omega t plus pi. This is the equation that describes the position as a function of time. And if you plot x as a function of time, you will get this curve in here. Now let's see what do we have. x is the position of the par particle, t is the time. What is xm? Xm is called the amplitude of the motion, the amplitude of the motion, and this is the maximum, the magnitude of maximum displacement. That is how far can the particle go from the origin. It doesn't matter this way or that way. We take the absolute value. We want just the distance, the maximum distance it can move from the equilibrium and that is called the amplitude of the motion. This whole bracket, omega t plus pi, is called the phase. So please distinguish. We have phase and phase constant. The phase of the motion is everything we have inside the bracket. It is omega t plus pi. That whole thing is called the phase. Phi itself, it's called, it is called the phase constant. So phi is the phase constant. And the phase constant, the importance of the phase constant is that it tells us the value of x at time t equal to zero. Because if you put t equal to zero, what you are left with is x at time t zero is equal to xm cosine of phi. So if you know what is phi, you can find the location of the particle at the beginning of the motion when you started the stopwatch. What is left there? We are left with this quantity here. What is this omega? Omega is called the angular frequency. We have the frequency and we have the angular frequency. It is just a mathematical quantity that is introduced to ease the mathematics. And we want to see now how is this quantity related to the frequency and the period. So omega is called the angular frequency, angular frequency. And to find its value, let's put phi equal to zero for simplicity. So what do we have? The equation for x becomes x of t is equal to xm cosine of omega t. And therefore, x at t plus capital T after one period, like we see in the lower figure there, is equal to xm cosine of omega replace t by t plus t, t plus capital T. This would be xm cosine of omega t plus omega capital T. And now, looking at the figure, the position of this point is the same as the position of this time, at uh, this point, which is displaced by one period. So, that means these two positions are the same. 
because they are separated by a period. Let's equate them. Xm cosine of omega t is equal to this. Xm cosine of omega t plus omega capital T. The Xm will cancel. Omega t is there. So what is our conclusion in here? You know from basic trigonometry that if you take an angle and add 2 pi to it, nothing will change in the sine, cosine, or tangent. So this quantity here is nothing but 2 pi. Now someone may, may say, why not 4 pi or 6 pi? That would be the next one. This is 2 pi. The next one would be 4 pi. The one after 6 pi and so on. But the first one immediately after it would be just the first possible value, which is 2 pi. From which you can see the relationship between the angular frequency and the period, omega is equal to 2 pi over the period. And the period is the reciprocal of the frequency. So you can say that this is equal to 2 pi multiplied by the frequency. And that's the relation between these parameters. From which you can see immediately uh, the SI unit for the angular frequency, its radians per second. Now we can see the effect of the various variables on simple harmonic motion. Here is the effect of uh, the, uh, the effect of the amplitude as you increase or decrease the amplitude the motion would be stretched or squeezed vertically. As you increase or decrease the period, the motion will be stretched or squeezed horizontally. The effect of the phase constant phi is shown in here. As phi changes, the whole curve shifts to the left or to the right, but without any vertical or horizontal compression. So these are the effects of these three parameters. With this now, we are in position to talk about the velocity. We know what is the position. To get the velocity, just take the derivative of this with respect to time. So here is the velocity in simple harmonic motion. You just take the derivative of that equation. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, and then we have the derivative of this will give me omega. So the velocity in simple harmonic motion will be V as a function of time is minus, that will come from the cosine, it will be minus sine, and this will give me omega, let's take it out, omega xm sine of omega t plus phi. And that's the equation for the velocity. This value here is the maximum value of the speed, because the maximum value of sine is plus minus one. In that case, what is the speed? It is equal to omega xm. More importantly, you can see now the shift or the phase relationship between the velocity and uh, the displacement. And that is shown in here. If we take phi equal to zero, this is x as a function of time, and this is the velocity as a function of time. You can see it here. X is a cosine, that's there. V is minus sine. Sine will be that way, but this is minus sine, so you invert the sine. And you can now compare the two. You can compare the two. First of all, realize that from here to here, this is quarter of a period. Okay, you can see that this is one full period. So quarter, one half, three quarters, full period. So from here to here, from maximum to zero, or zero to maximum negative, that will be quarter of a period. And therefore, if you compare these two, how do we get the velocity from the displacement? It's like you took the displacement and shifted to the left by quarter of a period that point will be there and this point will come there this one will be here and so on so the relationship between the velocity and displacement 
is that there is a shift to the left by quarter of a period between these two curves. And because of that, you can see the physical relationship between the two. Where one is maximum, the other one is zero. When we have maximum displacement, when we go to the end of the motion, the particle will stop momentarily and then reverse its motion. So when we have maximum displacement, either positive or negative, the velocity at these points will be zero. And where x is zero, when it passes the equilibrium point, that's where we have the maximum speed, be it positive or negative, depending on the direction of travel, but that's where we have the maximum value of the speed. In the same way, we can now proceed to find the acceleration, and the acceleration is found by taking the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So let's find out the acceleration. Take the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. What do we get? The derivative of sine will be cosine, and the derivative of this will give me omega. So this will be minus omega squared xm cosine of omega t plus phi. And that's the equation for the acceleration. A, as a function of time, is minus omega squared xm cosine of omega t plus phi. And that's the equation for the acceleration, from which you can see that the maximum value of the acceleration is equal to omega squared xm. Now we can see something interesting. If we compare the acceleration to uh, the position, look at this quantity here. Okay, look at this one. What is it equal to? It is nothing but the position. That's exactly repeated there. So we can write the equation compactly as a squared is equal to minus omega squared x. A, sorry, a is equal to minus omega squared x. So it is opposite to the displacement, but otherwise they are proportional to each other. It's a linear relationship, and the constant of proportionality is the angular frequency squared. So we reach to this important conclusion, and that is the acceleration is proportional to the displacement, but opposite inside. Okay? And this is illustrated in this comprehensive figure here that shows the oscillation, the simple harmonic oscillation of a block on a frictionless surface. Let's see what do we have. These are the amplitudes instead of xm, now it is called a. So when the object reaches the amplitude, its velocity there is zero. The displacement is positive, but the acceleration is negative. Remember, the spring force, it will always try to bring the block back to equilibrium position. So that's the direction of the force, and that's the acceleration. The displacement is positive, acceleration is negative the block will start to move. When it reaches the equilibrium position, x is zero, and that's where we have the maximum speed, okay? As we found there, the maximum speed, and in this case, it is moving to the left. It will continue to move until it reaches the other end of the motion. There, it will stop momentarily. And where is the acceleration now? The displacement is negative, but the acceleration is in that direction, toward the origin, so it will be positive. Negative displacement, positive acceleration. Positive displacement, negative acceleration. So they go opposite to each other as shown in this figure. With this now, we come to the last subject we have today, where we talk about the force responsible for simple harmonic motion.
And the system that we will use to study the force is again the mass spring system. Okay, so let's use it to find the force responsible for simple harmonic motion. So this is now the force law, the force law responsible for simple harmonic motion. For that we consider uh, a block of mass M connected to a spring of a spring constant K that oscillates on a frictionless surface. And what we want to do now is to combine simple harmonic motion as we found it in here to Newton's second law. Here is how we have it. Newton's second law says F is equal to M A and A is there. So this is minus m omega squared x. And now compare this to Hooke's law that we studied in chapter 7. The spring force, what is it equal to? f is equal to minus k times x. Okay? There is f, the negative sign is there, x is there, so what is our conclusion? The spring constant k is equal to m omega squared. And we have this immediate relationship, k is equal to m omega squared. From which you can see that omega for this system is equal to k over m under the square root. And therefore you can immediately calculate the period. It's 2 pi over omega. So 2 pi multiplied by m over k under the square root. What is so interesting about the period is that it is independent of the amplitude. It's independent of the amplitude. Whether you take it 1 meter or 10 meters, it will take the same amount of time to make one oscillation. The period will not change. Because if you move it farther away, the force will become larger. So it will pull uh, the block with a stronger force and make it move faster and therefore take the same amount of time to make one full oscillation. And therefore, the conclusion we make out of this for the mass spring system is that simple harmonic motion <coughs> is the motion executed by a particle that is subject to a force that is proportional to the displacement of the particle from the origin Look at the lower figure, and you can see that two, these two vectors are always opposite to each other. So displacement from the origin, but opposite inside. Whenever you have a force that behaves this way, it is opposite to the displacement, and linearly proportional to the displacement, that's the sign of simple harmonic motion. And that will, uh, just conclu to conclude this one, you can see the relationship between the force and the displacement here. It's a linear relationship, and therefore, this is called, usually if you read the problems, it says a linear oscillator. This is the linear oscillator, and that's because of this. So this is a linear oscillator. And that now tells us where did the word simple come from. It comes from this relationship. It's a very simple relationship between the force and the displacement, just linear relationship. Nothing is easier than the linear relationship. And therefore, this is called simple harmonic motion because of that relationship. So in this way, we have discussed the basics of a simple harmonic motion and the kinematics, position, velocity, and acceleration.
let's now take some examples from the book on this type of motion. And we will start with this simple straightforward example just to warm up uh, with the quantities here. It's a very simple, just a summary of what we have just discussed. So 1501 says a block whose mass is 680 grams. We have the mass. This is the mass spring system, okay? 0 0.68 kilograms is fastened, attached, connected to a spring whose spring constant K is equal to 65 newtons per meter. The block, the block is pulled a distance of 11 centimeters from its equilibrium position. The equilibrium position is at x equal, so here is the equilibrium position at x equal to zero. We pull it 11 centimeters from there on a frictionless surface and released from rest of tank equal to zero. So what is this 11 centimeters? This is the maximum distance it will go. It will not go beyond that. Okay, it will not go beyond what we pulled it at the beginning. So this is basically the amplitude of the motion. Immediately, we glint from the language A, the amplitude is equal to the 11 centimeters, or 0.11 meters. What are the angular frequency, the frequency, and the theta? The angular frequency for this system, here is the equation, omega is K over M under the root, there is k, there is m. Divide and take the root, and you will find that omega is equal to 9.8 radians per second. And therefore, the period is 2 pi over omega. There it is. And uh, that is equal to 2 pi over omega. That will be 0 0.64 seconds. And the frequency is the reciprocal of the period. Take one over this, and that will be 1.6 hertz. C, what is the maximum speed of the oscillating block? And where is the block when it has this speed? Well, the maximum speed, we saw it from the equations, it is omega xm. Here is omega, and here is xm. Multiply these two, and that will be equal to 1.1 meters per second and it attains this speed at the origin. At the origin, it will move fastest with the highest speed at x equal to zero. D, what is the magnitude AM of the maximum acceleration? AM, again, if you look at the equations we wrote, is omega squared XM. So omega squared times XM, that will be equal to 10.5 meters per second squared. And that is obtained, although he doesn't ask about it, this is obtained at x equal to plus minus xm at the extremes of the motion. What is the phase constant of the motion? Now to find the phase constant, you set the time t equal to zero. Okay, so x, here is the equation, xm cosine of omega t plus five. That's the general equation. Find how much is this at time t equal to zero. x at zero is equal to xm cosine of five. Well, at time t equal to zero, it is pulled to the maximum distance. So x at zero is nothing but the amplitude itself. xm cosine of five. Cancel this. Cosine phi is one. That means phi is equal to zero. And then what is the displacement function? The displacement will be x is equal to 0.11 cosine 9.8t. That's the equation of motion of this part. Next, we will take this sample problem and conclude with it. It's a very difficult problem, and it is about finding the phase constant. In this case, it was easy to find it, but in more general cases, you have to see what is the procedure to find the phase constant. So that's what we will see now in this problem. I will remove this because I need the space here.
Okay, the problem says, at time t equal to zero, let, let's before we do that, since he's talking about x, b, and a, let's write the equations for these, the general equations that we have discussed in our discussion. x as a function of time is x m cosine of omega t plus phi. v as a function of time is the derivative of this minus omega x m sine of omega t plus phi. a as a function of time, derivative of this minus omega squared x m cosine of omega t plus phi. Now let's find how much are these at time t equal to zero, because that's what is given in the problem. Let's put zero. x of zero, x of zero, is equal to x m cosine of phi. v of zero is equal to minus omega x m sine of phi. a of zero is minus omega squared times x m cosine of phi. I will call this one, this two, and this three. Now read the problem. The problem says at time t equal to zero, at time t equal to zero, the displacement x of zero of the block in a linear oscillator, linear oscillator means mass spring system, is minus 8.5. So x zero is known, minus 8.5. The block's velocity v of zero then at time t equal to zero is minus 0.92, that is this one. And its acceleration, a of zero, is plus 47. What do you want to find? Three things. The angular frequency, the phase constant, and the amplitude, xm. Let's start with the angular velocity. Here we have the three equations. How do you use them to find the angular velocity? Well, you have to have an equation that has omega, so you must use two or three, one of the two, in addition to one. Now, which should we use? I think it is logical to use one and three, because if you divide them, they both have cosine, so cosine and the angle phi will disappear. Let's do that. Let's divide three over one. Three divided by one will give me a of zero, over x of zero is equal to minus x m will cancel and we have omega squared cosine will cancel so omega is equal to put the sign here minus a of zero over x of zero under the square root now remember that Let, let's put the numbers minus what is a of zero 47.0 what is x of zero minus 0 0.085 so here the minus will cancel and you have a positive number under the root put in the numbers and you will find that omega of this oscillator is equal to 23.5 radians per second. Now let's proceed to find phi. To find phi, you either take two with three or two with one, because we must, we need phi. So what I will do is I will divide two over one, two over one. V of zero over A, or uh, sorry, X of zero, x of zero is equal to divide this over that minus omega x m will cancel sine over cosine will be tangent of phi so phi is equal to tangent inverse of minus v of zero over omega x of zero and now Put the numbers carefully. This is tangent 
inverse of minus v of 0 minus 0 0.920 over omega 23.5 times x of 0 that it is SI units minus 0 0.085 Okay, so minus, 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 that will remain, and this will be tangent inverse of minus point 0.46, this whole thing. Now, if you use your calculator, if you put tangent inverse minus point 0.46 in your calculator, the answer that your calculator will give you is minus 24 Point 0.7 degrees. That's what you get from the calculator. Now, how much is that? Ask yourself. Where can I have a negative tangent? In which quadrant? Second or fourth? So now, take this number, add it to 180, subtract it from 180, add it to 360, subtract it from 360, whichever answer you get in the second or fourth quadrant will be the correct answer. So, if you take these combinations, you will find that one answer for phi is when we add 360 to this, 360 minus 24.7. That will give me 335 degrees. That's the fourth quadrant. And this is one answer. The other answer, phi 2, is when you add 180 to this, 180 minus 24.7, and that will give me 155, second quadrant. Mathematically, both will give me that tangent. Now let's look at the physics, because we have to pick one of them. And to pick one of them, let us substitute these back into the equation for x of 0. Let's take the first one. Cosine of an angle in the fourth quadrant would be positive. Is x0 positive? No, it is negative. So this is not the correct answer. Let's take the second possibility. Cosine of an angle in the second quadrant will be negative. Negative. Is x0 negative? Yes, it is negative, so that is the correct answer there for the phase constant. And that shows you how difficult it is to deal with this quantity. The last thing you are dealt with, or you need, is to find the amplitude of the motion. Go back to 1. If you go back to 1, you can see that the amplitude, xm, is equal to x at 0 divided by cosine of phi. Now we know what is phi x0 is given, put them the two together, and that will be 9.36 centimeters as the amplitude of this motion. And that is the end of our discussion for this lecture. Okay, today we continue our discussion of uh, chapter 15. Uh, in the last lecture, we discussed simple harmonic motion. We saw the kinematics and dynamics of this type of motion. Specifically, simple harmonic motion is an oscillatory motion in which the object moves back and forth about an equilibrium position. Like any periodic motion, it is uh, characterized by the period of the motion, its frequency, and the angular frequency. And these uh, three parameters are <coughs> related by these equations. The position, velocity, and acceleration are all functions of time, and they are sinusoidal functions of time. 
the most important uh, property is that the acceleration, you can see that this is X. So the acceleration is opposite to the displacement from the origin. Uh, it is proportional, they, uh, it's a linear relationship, but it is in the opposite direction. The speed is greatest at the equilibrium position and zero at the extremes of the motion. We also consider the mass spring uh, system and from it we can see that simple harmonic motion requires the presence of a restoring force that brings the system back to equilibrium. For this case, we equated Hooke's law to the equation uh, that connects acceleration with position in simple harmonic motion, and we got the properties of the motion from this equality. Today we have two topics to consider. The first one is energy in simple harmonic motion, and the second one is the pendulum. Let's start with energy. For that, we consider the linear oscillator, the mass spring system, it also, is also called the linear oscillator, and that's because the force depends linearly on the displacement. That's indeed why we call it simple harmonic motion. So we consider uh, the linear oscillator, oscillator shown below. The energy of the linear oscillator transfers back and forth between kinetic energy of the block and potential energy of the spring. The mechanical energy of this oscillator remains constant if we don't have friction between the block and the surface. The potential energy of the linear oscillator is associated entirely with the spring. Its value, like we derived in chapter 8, is 1 half kx squared, but now x itself is a function of time, so the potential energy is a function of time. The kinetic energy is associated entirely with the block. Its value is 1 half mv squared. v again is a function of time, so the kinetic energy is also time dependent. With that now, let's drive the equations for the kinetic, potential, and mechanical uh, energy of the linear oscillator. <coughs> So this is now section 15.2. And here we are talking about energy in simple harmonic motion. <coughs> we start with the potential energy of the oscillator. <coughs> and the potential energy, of course it is a function of time now, is one half K. <coughs> x as a function of time squared and here is the equation for x square it so what we will have is one half k x m squared cosine squared of omega t plus phi that's the potential energy the kinetic <coughs> energy as a function of time is one half m v as a function of time squared and here is the equation for v square it multiplied by m over 2 and this is equal to one half m and then we have omega squared x m squared sine squared of omega t plus phi <coughs> Here are the equations that govern the uh, linear oscillator. We saw that omega is root k over m. So omega squared is k over m. m omega squared, which is what we have here, is equal to the spring constant k. So this is equal to, we will replace that by k. This is one half k. x m squared sine squared of omega t plus phi. And now, let us look at these two equations. <coughs> and here is what we observe. One half k x m squared is there. One half k x m squared is there. So we take it as a common factor. 
cosine squared plus sine squared of any angle, the angle is the same, is equal to 1. So with that, the mechanical energy of the system, E, is equal to K plus U. So like I said, you, take, you, you add these two equations, take this as a common factor, cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, so what we are left with is just a common factor, which is 1 half k x m squared. From which you can immediately see that this is constant. k is constant, the amplitude is constant, so this is a constant quantity that doesn't change <coughs> with time. <coughs> and one more thing we can see is that the mechanical energy of the system is proportional to the amplitude. The more is the amplitude, the higher will be the mechanical energy of the oscillator. These relations are shown <coughs> graphically in here. Here are the functions or the quantities as functions of time. Let's look at u. U goes as cosine squared, which is the green curtain here. So when it is zero, that's maximum. And then it goes like cosine squared. The kinetic energy goes like sine squared. So at zero, it is zero. And that is this curtain here. If you now add these two curves point by point, like at this value of the time, add this plus that, and you get that value. And if you repeat that for all points, the sum, the two quantities, it change with time. But if you add them point by point, the sum will be constant, and that's the mechanical energy of the system, and that, as we saw, is a constant. As functions of position, they look like this. The kinetic energy is zero at the extremes. When the particle reaches, the maximum point, the amplitude, it will stop momentarily and come back. It will stop. So there at the end, the speed is zero, so the kinetic is zero, the kinetic energy. The same thing happens on the other side. In the middle, at the equilibrium position, where x is zero, that is where it is moving fastest, so that's where we have the maximum kinetic energy. The potential energy will be exactly the opposite because it depends on x. <coughs> so here, this is the maximum value of x, so the maximum value of the potential energy. Here, x is zero, so the potential energy is zero. The mechanical energy, the mechanical energy is the sum of the two. So if you add again, point by point, add the green and the red curve, the result will be this line in here. And here is another way. Uh, to see the situation, okay, at the beginning of the motion, when the particle starts moving that way, at that point, all the energy is kinetic, uh, is, is potential, kinetic is zero, then as it moves toward the origin, part of the potential is converted to kinetic. When it reaches the equilibrium position, <coughs> x is zero, so the potential energy is zero, all the energy is kinetic, then it will, it will be converted back to potential as it goes that way until again it becomes totally potential at the other extreme. Wherever it is, if you add the blue and the green columns, that will give you the golden column, which is the mechanical energy of the system. So that's about the first topic we have today, which is the energy in simple harmonic motion. Let's now move to the <coughs> second topic, which is the pendulum. And watch the sections we are skipping. The pendulum is the second system that we study that executes simple harmonic motion. The first system is the mass spring system. The second system is the pendulum. We know that the pendulum executes periodic motion So now we want to prove that it is simple harmonic motion 
and we want to find the period. In any periodic or oscillatory motion, the most important quantity is the period. If you find the period, you can uh, adequately describe the motion and possibly find all the rest of the quantities. <coughs> A simple pendulum, like we saw many times before, starting in chapter 8, consists of a particle of mass m suspended from uh, one end of an unstretchable massless string of length L that is fixed at the other end. The particle is free to swing back and forth in the plane of the page, in the plane of the page, about the vertical line, now it is not oscillating about a point like the mass spring system, now it is oscillating about uh, a line, <coughs> a vertical, the vertical line through the pendulum's pivot point. Now let's study the dynamics of this motion. So we draw the three body diagram of the particle and show the forces acting on it. There are two forces acting on it. The first one is the gravitational force, and the other one is the tension. Now, in the case of linear motion, the mass spring system, we analyze the, 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 uh, the system in terms of the forces. In this case, we have rotational motion, okay? So we will not talk about the forces, but rather we will talk about the torque. And we want to analyze the torque taking the pivot point as the center of rotation and ask what forces will exert torque about that point. You have two forces. The tension will not exert any torque because remember the torque is R F sine of phi. This is R and it is along the tension. So the tension will not exert any torque. What about the gravitational force? Well, for the gravitational force, this is R, okay? It is the vector that goes from the pivot to the point of application of the force. So this is R, and here is the force. There is now an angle between the two. There is distance, and there is angle. So the gravitational force can exert torque on the particle about the pivot. And to see the effect of the gravitational force, we will resolve it into two components. Here is our coordinate system now. Its origin is the particle itself, and it oscillates with the particle. This is not a fixed coordinate system. Now, in this system, you can see that the gravitational force can be resolved into two components, a component that is tangent to the circle and a component that is radial along uh, the string itself. Which of the two will produce torque about that point? Of course, it is the tangential component. Okay, the one opposite to the sine F, sine of theta, because for that one, the angle is zero or 180 degrees, so it will not exert torque. So this tangential component produces a restoring torque, a torque that will always try to bring the particle back to its equilibrium position. So it's like the spring force, now it is a restoring torque, about the pendulum's pivot because that component, the tangential component, always acts opposite to the displacement of the particle so as to bring the particle back toward its central position, which is theta equal to zero. Here, the angular displacement is, uh, is what is counterclockwise, so the restoring torque is clockwise. It acts opposite to the displacement. With this analysis now, we have analyzed the situation completely. We will make use of this analysis to find the period of the motion. <coughs> and here is our uh, coordinate system. So, <coughs> for the simple pendulum, the situation looks like the following. This is now section four, in which we analyze the pendulum. 
And we will first <coughs> start with the simple pendulum. What is with the simple pendulum? Well, we have a particle, so a point, and the mass of the string is negligible. That's the simple pendulum. So like we saw the, with the analysis of the force, the restoring torque, we will start with the torque. Remember that the torque is equal to Rf sine of phi. So what is the torque acting on the particle about the pivot? Well, the torque is equal to tau. It's a restoring torque. It's opposite to the displacement. And its value is equal to the force now is the gravitational force and R is the distance between the particle and the pivot, which is L. And this angle phi is now what we call theta. So this is equal to minus mg L sine of theta. That is the, the historic torque. And now we will apply the other equation we have with the, for the torque, which we saw back in chapter 10, the angular form of Newton's second law, tau, is equal to I alpha, okay? So tau is equal to I alpha. Alpha is the angular acceleration, and I is the rotational inertia. What do we have now? We have a particle of mass m that is the distance L from the axis of rotation. What is its rotational inertia? m r squared, and r is L, so this is M L squared. Let's put that here. The torque is equal to M L squared multiplied by alpha. Let's leave the substitution for M L squared to the, to the end. Let's keep it as the rotational inertia because that, that will give us more generality. So I alpha. Let me again <clears throat> keep this for a while. Let me write it down. Tau is equal to I alpha. And work first on this one. If we invoke the small angle approximation, the small angle approximation, we can replace sine of theta by theta itself. This is called the small angle approximation. It says sine of theta is approximately equal to theta itself if two things. First, theta is small, and second, theta is measured in radians. Of course, you cannot apply it to degrees. You cannot say one is equal to 90. That's what happens if you, if you use degrees, so you must use it in radians. How good is this approximation? You can see that in here. Here is theta in degrees, <coughs> and here is either sine of theta or theta in radians. So the black line is obtained by simply converting theta from degrees to radians. You know the relationship 90 or 180 degrees is pi radians. So you can use that to take any angle in degrees and convert it to radians. And what you get is that line in there. The blue line is sine of theta. It doesn't matter whether it is degrees or radians. You set your calculator accordingly. And then you plot the two. You can see that up to almost 25 degrees, these two quantities are almost identical. But then there will be deviation between the two that increases as theta increases. So as long as you are in this range, you can safely replace sine of theta by theta itself, because you can see that they are equal if theta is measured in radians. So we will use that small angle approximation to simplify this equation, and that will be minus mgl times theta itself. And now, we will combine these two equations, okay? 
on both the left side is tau, so let's equate the right hand side, from which you can see that <coughs> I alpha is equal to minus MGL multiplied by theta, and from there you can see that alpha is equal to minus MGL divided by I multiplied by theta. And now let us compare this to the mass spring system or the general motion of simple harmonic motion. What did we say there? There we said that the acceleration for simple harmonic motion is opposite to the displacement from the origin. And here is the equation. You can compare these two equations. X is what we have here. So A is equal to minus omega squared X. And therefore, whenever you have simple harmonic motion, the acceleration and displacement are proportional to each other, but opposite to each other. And the constant of proportionality is the square of the angular frequency of the motion. That's exactly what we have here, okay? Compare the thing. Here is the corresponding acceleration instead of the linear. Now we have the angular acceleration. And instead of the linear displacement, now we have the angular displacement x, uh, theta, the minus sign is there, and therefore this quantity here is the square of the angular frequency of the simple pendulum. We proved two things. We proved that it is simple harmonic motion, and we found the value of omega. So with that, we can now utilize this result and immediately <coughs> glean what is the value of omega for the simple uh, pendulum, that would be equal to mgl divided by i under the square root. And with this now, you can calculate the period of the motion. The period of the motion is equal to 2 pi over omega. The period is equal to 2 pi over omega which means 2 pi over this, so it is 2 pi i over mgl under the square root. So here is the equation we are looking for. Only thing now <coughs> is that for the simple pendulum going back in here, as I said, i is the rotational energy of the particle, this is what happens with the simple pendulum. I is equal to m r squared, which is m l squared. So you can take that in there and find that the period of the simple pendulum is equal to 2 pi m l squared divided by m g l under the square root. So the period is 2 pi, the mass cancels, this square will cancel this L, and you have L over G under the square root. This is the period of the simple pendulum. Now, <clears throat> what we see from here is that the period is independent of the mass. Whether you put one gram or one kilogram, as long as you can shrink it, to a point, it will not appear, the mass will not appear, it will not affect the period of the motion. So that is about the uh, simple pendulum. Now let's go to the more realistic situation, which is the physical pendulum. In the simple pendulum, we ignored the mass of the pendulum. Now let's take that into account, okay? Let's take a real. Uh, pendulum where we cannot ignore the mass of the string itself. So, a real pendulum, which is also called a physical pendulum, can have a complicated distribution of mass. 
it, it doesn't have to be just a simple massless string. It could be any shape of any mass. So it can have a complicated distribution of mass, much different from that of a simple pendulum, as shown, for example, in this figure. Uh, now you make your pendulum instead of a string, you make it, for example, a baseball bat, which has a finite size and finite mass. You cannot replace this by a simple massless string. So how do we deal with this situation? Well, you analyze the dynamics like in the previous situation, except that in the simple pendulum, the gravitational force was the weight of the particle, which is right at the end. Now the gravitational force is the weight of the object itself, which acts at the center of mass of the object, wherever it is. That's where the gravitational force acts. And now, the distance between the center of mass and the pivot, we call it H, is the distance of interest now. It is that distance that controls the period of the motion. For a physical pendulum, again, you can re uh, resolve the gravitational force into a tangential restoring force and the radial component. So for a physical pendulum, the restoring component, which is Fg sine of theta of the gravitational force, has a moment r, which is the distance h, from the pivot to the center of mass, about the pivot rather than the string length there. So instead of caring about the length of the object, now we care about the distance between the pivot and the center of mass. The period of motion in this case is exactly what we have here, except we have to replace L by H. And you get the same equation if you go through the derivation again. So the period of motion is 2 pi I over MGH. Here is the change or the difference between the simple pendulum and the real or physical pendulum. So let's write this down for a physical pendulum for a physical pendulum the period of the motion t is given by that equation t is equal to 2 pi i over m g h under the square root in this equation i is the rotational inertia about the pivot and h is the distance between the pivot and the center of mass of the object. Once you find these two quantities, you can plug in and find the period of the physical pendulum. You can read in the book about how can the physical pendulum be used to measure the experimental value of the gravitational acceleration. And this is the point in chapter 15 in which we will stop uh, our discussion. This is indeed the end of the material for Physics 101. Chapter 15 has other topics that we didn't cover. Here are some of the interesting topics. I leave that for you to read uh, if you are interested from the book. Uh, like how does friction affect simple harmonic motion? Well, if there is friction, the amplitude of the motion will not be constant, but it will decrease with time because energy will be wasted as friction between the object and the surface. Another topic in chapter 15, which we did not discuss, very interesting one, and that is what is the relation between simple harmonic motion and uniform circular motion? Something that we studied many times before. Well, you can think of simple, uh, uniform circular motion as two simple harmonic motions. One that takes place along the x direction and another that takes place along the y direction. In the, the, the remaining time today, we will uh, consider a problem on a physical pendulum and analyze it to find the period of the motion. And that is problem seven in the textbook.
<coughs> it's about the physical pendulum. The problem says a pendulum consists of a uniform disc with radius small r, 10 centimeters, and mass 500 grams attached to a uniform rod with length 500 millimeters, half a meter, and mass 250 grams. So this is like the hand in an old clock, antique clock. So that's what we have there, okay? It's exactly like what we have here. Now, the end of this problem is we want to get the period. That's what we want to do at the end. But to find the period, we have to find the rotational inertia of this system, and we have to find where is the center of mass, the distance between the pivot and the center of mass. So this is what is requested in these two points. Ultimately, we will use them to find the period. So let's go through them one by one. Let's find first the rotational inertia of the pendulum about the pivot point. So what we will do is we will find the rotational inertia of the rod about the pivot and the rotational inertia of the disc about the pivot, add them, that will give us the total rotational inertia. So in my solution, I will refer to the rod by the letter R and the disc by the letter D. Let's start with the rotational inertia of the rod. Here we go back to chapter 10. We did that example. If you have a rod that rotates about its end, not about its center, about its end, we found what is the rotational inertia of the rod using the parallel axis theorem. There we saw that it is equal to 1 over 3, 1 over 3, mass of the rod, length of the rod squared. Okay, that's 500, and the mass is, where is the mass of the rod? The mass of the rod is 250 grams. So put the two in here, and you will find that this is 0 0.0. 208 kilogram meter square. Now we come to the disc. The disc is not rotating about its center. It is rotating about that point. So for the disc, we will apply the parallel axis theorem. What does it say? I of the disc is equal to the rotational inertia about the center of mass plus mass of the disc multiplied by the distance between the two axes. This is one axis, the center of mass, and this is the axis of rotation. What's the distance between them? It is all of this L plus small r. So L plus small r squared. What is the rotational inertia of the disk about its center of mass? We saw that many times before in chapters 10 and 11. This is one half mass of the disk, radius of the disk, which is small r in the problem squared, plus mass of the disk into L plus r squared. And now we have it all. The mass of the disk is given uh, 500 grams. The radius is 10 centimeters. And the length L is 500 millimeters. Make sure that everything is in SI units, kilograms and meters. And if you put the numbers, you will find that the rotational inertia of the disk is equal to 0.1825 kilogram meter squared. So the rotational inertia of the whole thing of the physical pendulum is the sum of the two. It is I of the rod plus I of the disk. Add this to this, and what you have is 0.20. 33 kilogram meter square. <clears throat> there is I. 
Now let us proceed to find the distance between the pivot, okay, the distance between the pivot point and the center of mass of the pendulum. Here is the pendulum. Its center of mass is somewhere in here. We want to find where is the center of mass relative to the pivot. So for that, we go back to chapter 10, find the center of mass of a rigid body. And the way we will do it is as follows. Here is the geometry, okay? Here is the problem given with its numbers. Here is the pendulum, okay? It consists of the rod plus the disc. Now I want to find where is the center of mass relative to this point. So let me put this on the x-axis to th see things clearly. Let me do it this way. Here is the origin. There is the x-axis. This is the point, my reference. I want to find the distance of the center of mass from this point. So I replace the two objects that I have, the disk and the rod. I replace them by particles located at the center of mass of, of that object. So I will replace the rod by a particle, particle number one, located where? How long is the rod? The rod is half a meter. So this distance is quarter of a meter. It's right in the middle of the rod. And what is the distance of that? There it is. The length is 500 millimeters. Half of that is 250 millimeters. And this is the mass of the rod. The mass of the rod is 250 grams. So that's the first particle. The second particle replaces the disc. So it is right at the center of the disc. How far is it? from the axis of rotation or from the origin? Well, it is all of that distance, right? There is the origin and there is the center of the disc. So it is L plus R. L is 50 centimeters plus 10, 60 centimeters or 600 millimeters. How much is the mass? The mass of the disc is equal to 500 grams. Now this back to chapter eight. Two particles located on the x-axis. These are their masses and coordinates. Find the center of mass. So the center of mass is located at this point, and that's the distance h we are looking for. The distance between the center of mass and the pivot. So applying what we know from chapter nine, h is equal to m1 x1 plus m2 x2 divided by m1 plus m2 and these values are listed here. Take them with the correct units, compare the units and you will find that h is equal to 0.483 meters. Okay, so that's how far is the center of mass of the whole thing from the pivot, and that's the distance h we need in here. Now we are in a position to find the period. The period is 2 pi i over m g h under the root, which will be 2 pi. Now let's put our numbers. i is 0 0.20, 33. m is the total mass, 250 plus 500, 750. So 0 0.75 times 9.8 times H 0 0.483, 483, and all of this under the root, which will give us a value of 1.5 seconds. So there is the period of this physical pendulum, and that is it for our class for today. Okay, today we have our third lecture on chapter 15, which will be dedicated to 
uh, textbook problems on the various concepts that we have covered in the chapter. So let's start with a quick review of the major concepts we have covered in the chapter. In this chapter, we discussed simple harmonic motion. We studied the position, velocity, and acceleration of a particle executing this motion. We also calculated the energy functions in simple harmonic motion. We basically considered two systems that execute simple harmonic motion. The first was the mass spring system, which has linear motion, and the second is the pendulum, which has a rotational periodic motion. Any periodic motion is uh, characterized by its period and frequency, which are also related to the angular frequency of the motion. Simple harmonic motion requires the presence of a restoring force or torque that brings the system back to its equilibrium position. Position, velocity, and acceleration are sinusoidal functions of time, either sine or cosine. The speed is greatest at the equilibrium position and zero at the extremes of the motion. The most important property is that the acceleration is proportional to the displacement but in the opposite direction. And here specifically are the equations. If we consider the mass spring system, the restoring force is given by Hooke's law, which is linearly proportional to the displacement. So that's we call it simple harmonic motion. And it is also called the linear oscillator because of this relationship. These are the equations for x, v, and t, sinusoidal, functions of time. <coughs> the, frequent, the angular frequency of the system is given by the square root of k over m, from which you can get the period of the motion. The energies of the oscillator are, here is the potential energy, and here is the kinetic energy. Both vary with time, but their sum, which is the mechanical energy, is a constant of the motion that is independent of time. So this is the first system, the mass spring system. The second system is the pendulum, and we consider two pendulums. The simple pendulum, in which we have a particle at the end of a massless string, uh, and for that uh, we found the period to be 2 pi, the length of the string over g. The second pendulum is the physical pendulum, where we take into consideration the pendulum itself, its mass and uh, length. And for that, the period is given by 2 pi i over mgh. i is the rotational energy about the pivot, and h is the distance between the pivot and the center of mass of the pendulum. And we have done a problem in the last lecture that shows us how to deal with the physical pendulum. So today we will consider problems from the textbook, and I will organize the problems as we uh, as we proceed, you will see the organization. First, we will do some general problems about uh, the, the simple harmonic motion. One of which is problem 23. Simple problem, straightforward, but there are some points that we want to get out of it. The problem says, <coughs> the problem says, the function x of t gives the simple harmonic motion of a body. At time t equal to 2.1, what are the displacement, velocity, and acceleration, and phase of the motion? So, we will start with the given equation for x. x as a function of time is equal to 6 cosine of 3 pi t plus pi over 3. The velocity is the derivative of this with respect to time. The cosine will become minus sine, and the coefficient of t, you take the derivative with respect to time, will get out, so minus 6 times 3 pi, 18 pi, the cosine will become sine, 3 pi, t plus pi over 3. The acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time, so again we will take 3 pi out, and the cosine will become sine. So minus 3 times 18, 54. Pi times pi, pi squared. This will become cosine 
3 pi t plus pi over 3. Now we want to find their values at this particular instant of time. So at time t equal to 2.1 seconds. What do we have? Let's look at x. x is equal to 6 times cosine of 3 pi into 2.1 plus pi over 3, <coughs> which will be 6 cosine, if you multiply these numbers, pi is 3.14 something, it's there in the calculator, you will find that this is cosine 20.84. All of that is 20.84. Now here is the important point that I want to bring to your attention. This number here, whatever you get from your calculation, this number will be in radians. And therefore, you have to set your calculator to the radian mode first, and then find the cosine. Or, change this number to degrees and keep using your calculator in the degree mode. But the most important thing you should know is whatever we get inside this bracket will be in radians. So you have to set your calculator in the correct mode. Now, once you realize that, you will find if you use the radian mode here and take the cosine multiplied by 6, you will find that x will be minus 2.44 meters. And then you can do the same thing with v and the same thing with, d, uh, with, with a. What is the phase of the motion? Remember, the phase is everything inside the bracket. So the phase is this number, 20.84 radians. That's the phase of the motion. What are the frequency and period of the motion? Well, a good practice is when you have the equation for the displacement is immediately write the general equation. x is equal to xm cosine of omega t plus phi. And then you can read the things directly. This is the period. This is omega and this is the, uh, the phase constant phi. So omega is the coefficient of time, which in this case will be 3 pi, from which you can get the period, which is 2 pi over omega. That is 2 pi over 3 pi. So this is 2 over 3 of a second. The frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So 3 over 2 will be 1.5 hertz. Simple, straightforward problem. The most important point is to watch what we said here. Next, let us look at problem 51 in the textbook. This is how we translate the language into numbers. Problem 51 says, an object undergoing simple harmonic motion takes 0.25 seconds to travel from one point of zero velocity to the next such point. Now, this is the problem in the book. <clears throat> to understand it, let's apply to one system that executes simple harmonic motion, which is the mass spring system. And let's apply what is given in the problem to this figure. It says, an object undergoing simple harmonic motion takes quarter of a second to travel from one point of zero velocity to the next such point. Where do we have zero velocity? at the end. Where is the next one? The other extreme. So it takes quarter of a second to go from here to there. Now let's translate that into period. What is the period of the motion? The period is one complete oscillation, which is the time to go from this point to there and back to this point. So what we are given in the problem is only the first half. And therefore, half of the period is what is given in the problem, 0.25. So the period is 0.5 of a second. Then the problem says <coughs> the distance between two, uh, the, the, the distance between those points, which points? The points of 
zero velocity. The distance from here to here is 32 centimeters. Translate that into amplitude. From here to there is two amplitudes. This is one and this is the other one. So 32 is two amplitudes. And therefore the amplitude is 32 over 2, which is 16 centimeters. Now, wh what is he looking for? Calculate the period. There is the period. The frequency. The frequency is reciprocal of the period. So 1 over 0 0.5 is equal to 2 hertz. And the amplitude, there we calculated the amplitude. So this is a simple translation of words into quantities using the figure we have there. The next concept we have in the problem is the energy concept. Let's now do some problems involving the energy. And we start here with problem 20 in the textbook, which says the following. It says an oscillating block spring system has a mechanical energy of 2 joules. So this is, uh, this is E. Okay, an amplitude of 10 centimeters at the maximum speed of 0.8 meters per second. Find the spring constant. Well, we write down the equation for the mechanical energy, which says E is equal to 1 half K XM squared, from which K is 2E divided by XM squared. Now, do we have that? We have the mechanical energy, that's 2 joules. The amplitude of the motion, 10 centimeters. We have them both, just change this to meter, and you will find that K for this spring is 400 newtons per meter. Find the mass of the block. Find the mass of the block. Before we find the mass, let's find the angular frequency. <clears throat> the angular frequency can be found from the maximum speed. How? Remember the equation for the velocity? V is equal to minus omega xm sine of omega t plus phi. And this is what we call the maximum speed. V max is omega xm. So omega is V max divided by the amplitude. Okay? The amplitude is given. And the maximum speed is given, plug them in here, and you will find that omega is equal to 8, 8 radians per second. With that now, remember that omega for the mass spring system is k over m under the root, so you can say omega squared did that, and therefore the mass is k over omega squared. And we have both of these, 400 over 64. That will give me the mass as 6.25 kilograms. What is the frequency? Well, we have omega. The frequency is omega over 2 pi, which you can readily find uh, the frequency from. The next problem we will do on energy is uh, problem 57. Very nice classic problem and it says the following the problem says and by the way I added these figures okay these figures are not in the problems I added them so you see what is going on when the displacement in simple harmonic motion is 0.4 times the amplitude so here is the mass spring system and that's the displacement this is the extreme of the motion, the amplitude xm. When the displacement x is 0.4 of that, like where I have this shot in here, when x is equal to 0.4 of xm, okay, what fraction of the total energy is kinetic and what fraction is potential? You can see that in here. Okay, draw this line. This is potential. And that is kinetic. How much of the total energy is potential and how much is kinetic? So we uh, write the equations for 
the potential and kinetic energies and find the corresponding ratios. The potential energy U is equal to one half K X squared. In our case, we are told that X is equal to 0.4 of XM squared. Okay? So let me now play with the numbers here. 0.4 squared is 0.16, and I keep everything else together. I have one half K and XM squared. What is that? That's the mechanical energy of the system. So that will be 0.16 of E. And therefore, answering the question, what fraction of the total energy is kinetic and what fraction is potential? Well, the potential energy is 0.16 of the total and therefore the rest is kinetic. Kinetic will be 0.84 of the total energy, okay? That's the fractions. Part B says, okay, at this point, the two energies are totally different. So the question now is, at what displacement, in terms of the amplitude, is the energy of the system half kinetic and half potential? At what point are the two energies equal? That's the intersection point here. This is where they are equal. So at what point to fix do we have this intersection? Well, we start with the uh, potential energy, U, and we want to find the point at which it is equal to the kinetic energy. Remember that the total energy, the total mechanical energy, is K plus U. So this is U plus U to U. Someone may say, why didn't you say K plus K? Well, if we are looking for the speed, I will use the kinetic energy. But now I am looking for the displacement. So that goes with the potential energy. And now substitute. E is one half K X M squared. Is equal to two times the potential energy is one half K X squared. Cancel one half K and then x squared is equal to xm squared over 2, which means that x is equal to plus or minus xm over square root of 2, which means plus or minus 0.7 of xm. <coughs> so they will not be equal in the middle of the range, <coughs> but rather at 0.7, which is close to the end of the motion. Okay, that's the point, point 0.7 xm is the point at which the two energies are equal. So these are uh, two problems on the energy concept. Now let's move to a different concept, which is not really considered in the chapter, but you find plenty of problems on it, and that is the concept of combination of springs. It, throughout, we dealt with the situation we have one block connected to a spring. What if we have a block connected to more than one spring. How do we deal with that? That's the combinations I'm, I'm talking about here. So let us discuss this idea and see how to deal with this situation. <clears throat> Consider the case where we have a block of mass M connected to two springs. Three situations can occur as shown in here. Either the block is placed between the two springs or the block is on one side and the two springs are on the other side and then they can be parallel to each other or in series with each other. So these are the three situations, the three basic situations that can occur from which you can build many other situations. Here is what we want. If we have a combination of springs, more than one spring, connected to a block, how do we deal with this? What we want to do is to replace the springs, whatever they are, with a single spring of effective constant K effective, or spring constant K effective. So whatever we, want, we have here, 
we want to conceptually, hypothetically, theoret theoretically, replace all of that with one spring, whose spring constant we will call it k expected, connected to the block. And what we want to do now is to find the value of the effective spring constant in terms of k1 and k2. We will not go through the math in here, but if you do so, you will find the answer to be like this. If the springs are connected like this, the effective spring constant is the sum. Okay, so the effective is stronger than the individuals, k1 plus k2. If they are connected in series, like we have in here, then you add the reciprocals now, and then take common denominator and reciprocate. So in this case, you find k effective to be k1, k2 over k1 plus k2. That's the effective spring constant in this case. And therefore, let's say the problem is two springs are connected to a block this way. What is the period of the motion? Will you first calculate k effective? And from k and the mass, we just deleted the thing, omega is k effective over the mass. You calculate omega, and from omega you can calculate the period. If you want to try your understanding of these situations, you can look at problem one in the book, which has this situation, that's this effective spring constant, or problem 14, in which they are connected in series. So in both cases, you are asked to find the frequency. Okay, the frequency is omega over two pi, and omega is k effective over m under the square root. Next, let us consider some graphical problems in which the information is given in the form of a graph. And we want to extract what we need from the given graph. So <clears throat> here we start with problem 38 in the textbook. What are we given here? We are given a graph of position as a function of time. Let's read. The problem says, what is the phase constant? Phi, okay? What is the phase constant for the harmonic oscillator with the position function x of t given in the figure? If the position function has the standard form, x m cosine omega t plus phi, the vertical axis scale is set by x s, that is this number here. This number here is equal to nine centimeters. So this goes like three, six, nine. Every line here corresponds to three centimeters. We want to find phi. Well, the key idea here is <clears throat> to find the phase constant, you treat the situation at t equal to zero, okay? Because you get rid of the time. So in this case, we want to deal with the position. So x is equal to xm cosine of omega t plus phi. x at zero is equal to xm cosine zero phi. There it is. So phi is equal to cosine inverse x zero over xm. Now get these from the figure. How much is the value of x at tan t equal to zero? Well, at tan t, this is tan t equal to zero. What is x? It is there, minus. And how much is this? This is three, so it is minus three. Minus three. Xm is the amplitude, and the amplitude, as you can see in here, the, the, the amplitude goes from plus nine to minus nine, so the amplitude is nine. The amplitude is nine. And therefore, putting that in here, you will find that this is equal to minus 3 over 9. So cosine inverse of 1 over 3. Minus, minus 1 over 3. And if you uh, uh, put your this number in your calculator, you'll get a value of 109. 0.5 degrees. Cosine is negative as well in the second quadrant and the third quadrant. So this is the answer in the second quadrant. If you want the answer 
in the third quadrant, then you subtract this from 360, and the answer you get is 250.5 degrees. Which of the two is correct? We cannot decide. We need extra more information to pick one of the two, like the example we did in the first picture. But these are the possible answers here. Okay. The next problem is similar to this one. Again, he will be asking for the phase constant, but instead of x versus t, now we are given v versus t. So let's read the problem. The problem says, what is the phase constant for the harmonic oscillator with the velocity function v of t given in the figure, if the position vector is given in the standard way, and vs is set by 8 centimeters per second. That is, this value is 8. So 2, 4, 6, 8. Every line here is 2. Like we did in the previous problem, we first find the equation for v, and then substitute at t equal to 0. The equation for v is you take the derivative of this equation, v is equal to minus omega xm sine of omega t plus phi. Remember that we call this the maximum speed, so you can say that this is v is equal to minus v max sine of omega t plus phi. So v at zero is minus v max sine of phi. And therefore phi is sine inverse of minus v0 over v max, which will be sine inverse of minus, what is v0? The value of the velocity at time t equal to zero. Here is time t equal to zero, what's the velocity? Two, four, six, eight. So eight, and the maximum speed is there. That's the maximum speed. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay, that will be there. So this is this is equal to sine inverse of minus point eight. Where is this? This is not in the second quadrant. This is third or fourth quadrant. So the answer you will get from the calculator is minus fifty three point one. Sine inverse minus 0.8 is that, if you get it from the calculator. How do you get the answers in the third and fourth quadrant? Well, for one, uh, you add 180, 180 plus 53, and the other one will be 360 minus 53. So the answers you will get is 307. I'm just rounding off. And the other one is 233 degrees. And that's... These are the possible answers for this problem. <clears throat> Let's take one more graphical problem. This is now energy given graphically, and that is problem four. It says, figure 1538 gives the one-dimensional potential energy, well, so this is the potential energy, as a function of x. Remember uh, this figure? Okay, so that is the green curve there. That's what is plotted here. The one dimension of potential energy will for a four kilogram particle. The function u of x has the form bx squared. So I will take it as if it were a mass spring system and call it one half kx squared. And the vertical axle, axis state scale is set by us is two joules so this is two joules this is one joule okay and then this is 0 0.25 0 0.5 0 0.75 1 2 okay if the particle passes through the equilibrium position if the particle passes through this point that's the maximum speed if the particle passes through the equilibrium position with a velocity of 85 centimeters per second will it be turned back before it reaches x equal to 15. If yes, at what position? And if no, what is the speed of the particle at x equal to 15? So we are given the speed at the origin. That's how much it is. 
and we want to find whether the particle will be able to reach x equal to 15 or not. If it reaches x equal to 15, what is its speed? If it doesn't reach x equal to 15, where will it stop before 15? The answer to all of this, of course, is by finding the amplitude of the motion. The amplitude of the motion will tell me whether it will reach 15 or not. So let's work out this problem and we will analyze it to find the amplitude of the motion. So we start with K max, the maximum kinetic energy is equal to one half M V max squared. One half times four times 0.85 squared, that will give me a value of 1.445 joules. And now remember this figure. This is the maximum kinetic energy. That's the number we have just found. And that's equal to, at that point, it's equal to the mechanical energy of the system. Okay, so the mechanical energy of the system is equal to one half K uh, x m squared. It is this that we want to find, the amplitude. So we found the mechanical energy. That's the maximum kinetic energy. What else do we need? We need to find k. How do we find k? The only thing we have is the graph. Okay, so we have to utilize the numbers we have here to find k. Well, for this system, u the potential energy is one half k x squared. So k is two u over uh, over x squared. What you have to do is pick a point on this curve, find the u and x of that point, and use them to find k. So pick the point that you can read the best. And I think if you look at this graph, it is this point here, because I can read the numbers clearly. For x equal to 10, the potential energy is 0.5. Okay, remember that this is 1, 2, so here it is 0.5. And therefore, I'll use that here. 2 times 0.5, and the corresponding x is 10 centimeters or 0.1 squared. From here, I can find the value of k, and if you do the numbers, you will find that this is 100 newton per meter. So now I can go back in here and find what is the amplitude. It is 2e over k under the square root. Let's put the numbers. 2 times 1.445 divided by 100 under the square root, and that will give me the amplitude as 0.17 meters, or 17 centimeters. So will the particle be able to reach x equal to 15? The answer is yes. It can reach 17. So definitely along the way it will pass x equal to 15 centimeters. And uh, if it can reach x equal to 15, then what is the speed of the particle at x equal to 15? To find the speed, we use the simple definition of the mechanical energy E is equal to K plus U. So K is equal to E minus U. One half MV squared is equal to one half K X M squared minus one half K X squared. We cancel the halves, take K as a common factor and divide it by M. So V squared is K over M into x m squared minus x squared. We found k, 100. The mass is four kilograms, there it is. x m, 0.17, x requested, 0.15. Put all of that in there, take the square root, and you will find that the speed of the particle at x equal to 15 centimeters is 0.4 meters per second. And then we extracted everything from the uh, given graph.
Let us conclude with a problem on pendulums. Remember, well, I leave uh, 15. Uh, let's see, 50, what is 50? Shows the kinetic energy of a simple harmonic oscillator versus its position. The vertical axis is set by 8 joules. So uh, what do we have? X, this is 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay. What is the spring constant? Okay, let's do that. That's straightforward. Number 50. What is K-max? K-max is there. So we said this is 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 12 joules. And like we said in the previous problem, K-max is K-max is equal to the mechanical energy of the system. And the mechanical energy is equal to 1 half K x m squared so k the spring constant is 2e over x m squared we found e 12 joules he is looking for the spring constant we found e what is x m x m is where the kinetic energy is zero remember where the kinetic energy is zero that's x m how much is that from the graph 12 centimeters that's where it is zero so read it substitute and find k. Let's finally uh, consider a problem on pendulums. In the class we did a problem on the physical pendulum. Remember the hand of the old antique clock. Now we will look at a problem on the simple pendulum and this is problem 62. The problem says suppose that a simple pendulum so we are dealing with a simple pendulum. Suppose that a simple pendulum consists of a small 60 gram particle at the end of a cord of negligible mass. If the angle theta between the cord and the vertical is given by this equation, so now we are given the equation for theta as a function of time, what are the pendulum length and maximum kinetic energy? Well, let's write the equation for theta. Theta, in general, is theta maximum. Uh, what, what is he using? Cosine of omega t plus phi. Okay, this is like x is equal to xm cosine omega t plus phi, but now we deal with theta. So in this problem, theta is given as 0 0.08 radians, 0 0.08, so that is theta max cosine of 6.8 radians t plus phi so immediately we can read that omega is the coefficient of t omega is 6.8 radians per second and therefore the period the period is 2 pi over omega just 2 pi over 6.8 and I didn't get that but we can get it if you if, if since you have omega but now remember that the period for uh, the period for a simple pendulum is 2 pi L over G under the square root so we have let me wipe out this Okay, let me not put the numbers now just leave it as symbolic and now if you equate the two equations you can see 2 pi over omega is equal to 2 pi L over G under the root so cancel the two pi's and what we want is the length square 1 over omega squared is L over G. So the length is G over omega squared. That is omega. G is 9.8. Therefore, you can find L is 0 0.212 meters. That's the, uh, the length of the simple pendulum. Now let us find the maximum kinetic energy. And this is not something trivial. So let's start with the linear case and then carry the discussion to the simple pendulum. 
okay, for the linear case, when we have linear motion, k is equal to one half m v squared. So k max is one half m v max squared. What is v? V, remember, is dx by dt. So we find the maximum value of this and then square it. Okay? Carry this now to this rotational motion. In the rotational motion, k max is equal to one half. But remember, instead of m, we use the rotational inertia, i. And then, instead of x, we use theta. d theta by dt max squared. And since this is a simple pendulum, it is only the particle that we care about. What's the rotational inertia of the particle? m l squared. So this is m l squared over 2, and then d theta by dt max squared. What is d theta by dt? Here is the equation. Take its derivative. So 6.8 will get out, the cosine will become a sine, and that uh, will be equal to minus 6.8 times 0 0.08 into sine of 6.8t plus 5. This is d theta by dt. So d theta by dt max is this number here because the maximum value of sine is plus minus one, and therefore d theta by dt max is 6.8 times 0 0.08, which is 0.544 radians per second. Now you have it all. Square that, multiply by this, and you will find that k max for this pendulum is 3.99 times 10 to the minus four joules, or 0.4 millijoules. That's the maximum kinetic energy of the pendulum. And that's all with regard to the problems on chapter 15 about simple harmonic motion.